So now we know what the Fed is going to do. So our next step is to now identify what the economy is going to do, what the federal government is going to do, and then how that's going to impact your profitability in the markets this year. So let's get going. Hey everybody, Courtney Smith here. Let's keep going. Is the economy going to cause the stock market to crash in 2023? Will the federal government cause the stock market to crash in 2023? Let's now explore how the economy and fiscal policy are going to affect the various major markets in 2023. In our previous video, we looked at Fed policy. Now let's take a look at the economy. So let's dive right in. So what you're going to learn in this video is some critical aspects to making money in the market. First of all, what's going to happen to the economy in 2023? A lot of variations in estimates out there. So we're going to tell you what's really going to happen. We're going to tell you why it's going to happen. We're going to talk about the yield curve, monetary policy, fiscal policy, and we're going to talk about shocks to the system. We're going to also create a scenario of the economy for 2023 and how this will affect all the various markets and how you can make money from it. Of course, we're going to do that. Now, this is video two in a series of videos. Let's start with the yield curve. This is one of my go to techniques for forecasting the economy. What this does is this shows there are several. Uh, there's really two major yield curves that economists look at. This is a chart of three month treasury bills minus 10 year note yields. Another famous one is two year note yields minus 10 years. And I've drawn a red line on this chart to show when it goes negative. Well, first of all, what is the yield curve? The yield curve is actually something very simple. It's just simply the shape of interest rates at different times in the future. So if 30 day, if 90 day treasury bills are at 1% and then one year at 2% and 10 year at 5%, then the yield curve would be if you were to connect those dots, okay? And it forms a curve, kind of a straight edged curve, but nonetheless, it's still a curve. So what we look at though, is the relationship between the various points on the yield curve. So in this case, as you can see, back in uh, 2019, the yield curve went negative. Now, what does that mean? It means that actually three month treasury bill rates were higher than 10 year treasuries. You can see that back in 2019. And then you can look over to the right hand side of the chart and you can see that the yield curve went negative a few months ago in October. But in between, it was basically positive. Now, here's the way you look at this. Two things to really look at. The more positive the yield curve is, which we saw in April of 2022, the more positive it is for the stock market and for the economy. The more negative it is, the more negative it is for the stock market and the economy. Now, back in 2019, the yield curve originally went uh, negative in March of 2019. Well, it turns out that when the stock market gets flat or goes negative, like it did in March of 2019, that's about a one year leading indicator of the economy. And of course, in March of 2020, we went into a deep recession. Most people say it was caused by COVID. No, nope. negative yield curve. We would have gone into a recession anyway. This year, we can see that the yield curve went negative. And in fact, we've already had two quarters of negative growth in GDP this year. And the yield curve, as you can see, is solidly showing that we're gonna have a recession in 2023. And it looks like the recession is going to hit probably in the second quarter, maybe not the first quarter, but the second quarter, because once again, this yield curve, when it goes negative, it's about a one year leading indicator. It can be it varies around that. Let's not let's not get too precise. All right. But nonetheless, it's a leading indicator of the economy. Now, here's the interesting thing. Twos, 
tens. That's the difference in yields between the two-year note and the 10-year note actually went negative in 2020, a year before the two negative quarters we had this year. But you can see that the three-month to 10-year note yield curve didn't at all. Now, here's the interesting thing. Two's tens, that yield curve, has predicted 14 out of the last 18 recessions, which is a spectacular track record and beats any economist in the world. But are you ready for this? The three month minus the 10 year has called every recession since World War II. It has an 18 out of 18 record. So am I confident we're gonna have a recession in 2023? You better believe I am. This indicator works great. Now let's take a look at the timing. This is, you can see over here that the timing of it, let's take a look over here. These are the different yield curves when we had from, these are the months from US yield curve inversions to recessions. So we can see in the second half of the 70s, it would take a little over a year. Then in the 70s and 80s, it would take about 12 months. Then it went here in the 80s and 90s, a little bit longer, sometimes as much as three years in the 2000s, almost two years in advance. But so that tells us we're going to see a recession in 2023. So another great indicator of the future, is, future economy is the leading economic index. Let's take a look at it. And this is produced by the conference board. Now notice right here, the leading index month over month is declining. It's declining sharply, saying once again, and this is about a six to 12 month leading indicator. So we can see right here that it dipped slightly negative here. Obviously this is COVID, so you can kind of throw that one out. But notice that it turned negative back in 2006. I mean, it's a great leading indicator of the economy. We had some weak spots here, but this is the weakest it's been since the 2008 recession. Uh, and of course, I'm going to, you know, I mean, yes, it's it's weak. It's not as weak as the COVID crash. But nonetheless, the leading economic indicator is telling us, and you can see it turned solidly negative in the middle of 2022. It's six to 12 months in advance. So that still looks like maybe second quarter is how I would interpret this. Could be first quarter when we look at this, could be third quarter, but probably second quarter is the best guess using the LEI. Now, here you can see it works great. Negative, 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 negative. Okay, I mean, come on. This, is, this has got a tremendous track record. Back here, it didn't quite turn negative back in 1959. I know you remember it well, and you were pretty irritated that the LEI didn't call that recession, but it was contracting sharply, so we'll give it a half credit on that one. But all the other recessions were led by the LEI. So tremendous track record. Now let's take let's break down the LEI as it is now. So we saw, as you saw in the chart two charts ago, it was down about a full percentage in one uh, in one month, which is a lot. Now what's really happening? Well, this these are all leading indicators of the economy. All of them are leading indicators of the economy, and you can see the majority of them are negative. The only positive one was stock market prices. We'll talk about that in our next video. I'm going to focus 100% on the stock market. But some of the big negatives, building permits. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. The, the, the housing market is the biggest uh, component of the economy. And so if building permits are a leading indicator of housing starts. So if building permits are down, that means housing starts will be down, which means the economy is going to weaken jobless claims. Everybody keeps telling us, oops, I, <laughs> I don't want to go back to that chart. Everybody keeps telling us the economy is really, really strong, but we can see that jobless claims are starting to increase, or in this case, they're a negative component, but it means that the labor market is starting to weaken as well. Consumer expectations. If consumers don't think the future is going to be good, then they start to save money and they don't spend money, and that weakens the economy. 
Institute for Supply Management, new orders, new orders lead new production and new orders are declining as well. And the rest of them are kind of flat, but you can see there's some big parts of the economy that are really starting to, to show a lot of slack coming into this economy. Now I mentioned housing, it's the largest part of the economy. Uh, more people are employed there, et cetera, et cetera. I hear from the National Association of Home Builders shows the housing market index, oops, a new record, a new record. This thing goes back to the 1980s. Here's what happened in 2008. It's plunging faster than it was in 2008. Now, the only question is, will it be as long as it was in 2008? And I think we're going to see this uh, housing market index uh, stay at a very negative rate all through 2023. All through 2023. Now, please, if you didn't watch our monetary video, go back and watch it because I'm going to talk about something called the Volcker mistake. I don't want to repeat that. But this might pop off and go up a little bit if the Fed creates the same Volcker mistake. But otherwise, it's going to be locked down at a very low level for the rest of 2023. Building permits, I already told you that was a, uh, a leading indicator of the economy. And look at this. It's coming down hard right now. It looks a lot like 2008. We're going to see this probably down at least in the minus 50% area, similar to 2008. You remember what the what the housing market was like back then? Yeah, I think you do. And you know it was a disaster. So if the biggest part of the economy is a disaster, yeah, you got it. Now, why was it a disaster? Because housing was incredibly unaffordable. So you can see here's where the housing affordability index was back in 2000, what led to the crash of housing in 2008. Guess what? We're worse off now. Houses are now at a new historic low in terms of affordability. The prices have skyrocketed because of massive Fed easing. And now interest rates are skyrocketing because of Fed tightening. So double whammy killing affordability nobody can afford about a, can afford a house anymore except the ultra rich and as a result we're just at the beginning of the housing collapse auto sales the second largest part of the economy now this one is not as bad off it's not as bad as housing that's for sure let's take a look so here we can see that in the middle part of this year this goes all the way back to 1970s and you can see actually 2008 was worse for the auto market than we've seen recently. Um, but you can see the auto market got pretty poor here in the middle of the year, although it's rebounded a bit recently. So it's not as bad off. I think it is going to go back down. We're starting to see stress in the credit market for auto loans. We're starting to see auto loans go down. If auto loans go down, then I think this little hook down that we're just barely seeing is going to continue back to negative. But as we speak, it's a positive for the economy. We always have to be intellectually honest. Inflation, of course, is a big factor that's causing Fed to be motivated. Now, I'm, I've, we talked all about inflation in the previous video, so I'm not going to repeat that stuff. But this is a fascinating chart. Right here, down at the bottom, you can see there's a black line here and then a red line. The black line starts in 1966 and goes until 1983. Oh, I remember it well. What can I say? Good times, good times. The red line shows current Fed policy, and this is CPI. So what we saw was we saw CPI skyrocket in 1973-74 causing the brutal bear market in the stock market of 1973-74, when it lost 50% of its value. And guess what happened too? Volume, it was just, it was like, a, it was like a paper cut every day for two years, because I do remember it. And what happened is volume shrunk to nothing. We saw a wave of bankruptcies in stock brokerage firms because there was no volume. We saw the New York Stock Exchange get down to less than a million shares a day. The total exchange of million shares a day. Shoot, I think I trade a million shares a, tra a day right now. But the point is, the Fed made a huge mistake 
inflation skyrocketed up. You remember, you probably remember, uh, we put in, uh, President Nixon put in wage and price controls. It was such a disaster. The Fed tightened monetary policy and inflation got back down to two or three percent. But then it skyrocketed to meet, reach the eventual high in 1980. And this is when Volcker came in and crushed the market and crushed inflation right here. And here's the Volcker mistake right over here. So we are now following exactly the same template of the 1970s stagflation. And <clears throat> we could be seeing exactly the same thing. And in fact, I do think we're going to see exactly the same thing. But this decline gets us back down to maybe 3%, 4%, something like that, 2% maybe if we're lucky, but not to zero. And then the Fed eases and ignites another inflationary spiral. That chart is important. No, we don't care about any of that. Fiscal policy. Now, we're going to have a recession in 2023. That's a done deal. It's baked into the cake. So here you can see the budget deficit. And here's 2020 when the budget deficit went completely haywire. And you can see we got down to almost $3 trillion. Now it turns out, and we'll come back to this back in our next video, but when the budget deficit is widening, in other words, when the government is going deeper and deeper in debt, that's bullish for the stock market because it boosts corporate earnings. And then this period here that we're still in, when the budget deficit shrinks, that's bearish. And this is one of the big reasons why we had a bear market this year in stocks. So right now, that's still a bearish factor for the stock market. But what's what's the Fed going to, I mean, sorry, what's the federal government and the state governments going to do if there's a recession? So b before we get there, let's take a look at this from another perspective. This is the federal surplus or deficit as a percent of the economy. So here you can see this is the second worst in history. Here's World War II over here. For heaven's sakes, the government borrowed a lot of money back in the 1940s, you know, just to defeat Nazism and Japan. I mean, just some minor little trivial problems. But here we are. We're seeing massive federal deficits as a percentage of the economy at levels we've never seen except in World War II. OK, not even the depression did we get even close to this. So guess what? We're going to see. Let me go to my next slide. It's not very hard to figure out what they're going to do. They're going to spend more money. They're going to extend uh, unemployment benefits to two years, three years. They're going to tighten the money, the, the, the uh, employment situation even more. And they're going to they'll finally get through a new law where they can uh, forgive student debt and then they're going to forgive all kinds of farm debt they're going to forgive uh ppe loans they're going to where they're going to spend money like drunken sailors and what that's going to do is it's going to widen the budget deficit and widening the budget deficit is bullish for the stock market let's carry on shocks well, you never know what a shock is because by definition, it's a unknown unknown, okay? If it's a known unknown, then it's not a shock. And if it's a known known, it's definitely not a shock. But an unknown unknown is a shock. So we don't know what they're going to be, but let's just take a look at a couple of possibilities. <clears throat> so one of them would be oil goes back up to 120 or more. Uh, and I think we're actually going to see that. Uh, it, it might take a little while, but I think we're going to see the Volcker mistake I talked about in the last video. And that's going to ignite the oil market to higher prices again. And that is, of course, bearish for the stock market near term, and it's bearish for the economy. If the Ukraine war expands, we are at the closest to a nuclear war that we've been since the Cuban missile crisis of the 1960s. So we have to go back to 1962 to be this close. Uh, the Biden administration has sent now $100 billion to the Ukraine. 
Let's put this in perspective. That's more than Russia's total military spending in a year. I think uh, at least double what the Russians usually spend. So we're talking about huge amounts of money going over there. Generally speaking, uh, if there's a if there's a weapon available, it's going to be used, and that makes uh, now there's no nuclear. Uh, well, we don't know. I shouldn't say it. I was going to say the the U.S. doesn't have nuclear. Uh, missiles in 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 Europe, but I should probably do more research to see if that's true or not. But the Russians obviously do, so that would be a shock to the market. Sorry about that. Uh, and let's leave it there. You can use your imagination. So let's put together a scenario now, based on our analysis that we've got going so far. The scenario. I think is fairly simple, but it is pretty indeterminate. There is a lot more uncertainty. This is not uncertain. We're going to go into a long recession, and this long recession is going to last at least a year. Um, why is it going to be a long recession? Because you saw the yield curve, the twos tens, shifted into a uh, recession a long time ago, months and months ago, and the three month tenure a few months ago. So they, as I say, they run a year or two in advance and they're getting more negative even as we speak. So that's gonna be a big deal going forward, all right? We're gonna see that way on, on the economy until into 2024. I don't have a good estimate of when it's gonna end, but as I say right now, I'm looking for the recession to officially begin again in second quarter and last all three, second, third, and fourth quarters of 2023, and probably at least into the first quarter of 2024. Now, at first, it's going to be mild like last year. Last year, we had a recession. They haven't officially called it that yet, but we had two quarters of negative growth, but it was modest, maybe 1% decline in GDP in two quarters. And at first, it's going to look like that. And here's what's weird about this particular recession. Because of the incredible amounts, the trillions of dollars, which I showed you a few minutes ago, that the federal government pumped into our pockets, we're all sitting on a mound of cheese in our savings accounts. Yeah, that's right, we got our government cheese here. And that government cheese we saved. Now, that's not like Americans. We don't save money, we spend money. We're the best at that. So the point is, is we still have money in our savings account. And as a result, we're going to spend that money. And that'll support the economy for, for three to six months more. So that's going to get us through the first part of the recession. It's going to be mild because we're going to spend the money in our savings accounts that we got from the government. OK, you see how that's going to work? All right. So that's my scenario. But then it's going to get worse because housing will bite. We'll start to see the auto industry bite and a bunch of other industries will start to bite as well as we get into the second and third quarter of next year. And the recession will get sharper and sharper and sharper. Now, that doesn't sound very good, but here's the th interesting thing. And I'm going to talk about this in more detail in our next video on the stock market. That's actually bullish for stocks. And I'll prove that to you in our in our next video. So uh, it's going to get more severe as the year goes on. So how are we going to make money on all of this? As you can see, when we combine the monetary and the fiscal policy, there's going to be some double shuffles in the stock market. And as I say, we'll get into detail on timing of that. So how are we going to make money here? Well, I think the way we're going to do is I think buying bonds is going to be one of the best markets there is. Because as the Fed reduces inflation because of their tightening policy, if inflation goes down, that's going to be very supportive of bonds. And as the recession gets worse and worse, um, you're going to see more and more people think that inflation is going to go to zero. And we're even going to start to see the gloom and doomers start talking about deflation. And so there's going to be this idea that deflation, that'll be late next year, but buying bonds is going to be one of the best markets, I think, of the year. Now, we might want to be selling stocks early. And then, as I say, if we just look at the economy and forget monetary policy and some of the other factors I'm going to talk about in our next video, 
then we'll buy stocks later in the year. And once again, I don't want to get into detail in stocks. That's going to be in our next video. Uh, we're going to want to sell and then buy gold later. Sell because uh, we're going to see real interest rates go up. If inflation does go down then the, and the Fed keeps monetary policy tight, then that's going to probably keep uh, uh, real interest rates high and that's negative for gold. And then say the reverse of that for the dollar for the, exactly the same reasons. Now, these are not my final estimates. I'm looking only at the economy. I'm going to do a separate video on each one of these factors. We're going to start with stocks next time, and then we'll have a video on gold, dollar, and bonds. We might combine gold and dollar, and we'll get into more detail where we add in many more factors to come up with a final estimate of how the world, how the these various asset classes are going to perform in the coming year, and also how we're going to play the market in the coming year. So crypto sell then buy. It's really highly correlated with stocks now, and is really sensitive to uh, monetary policy. But we also need to choke out the uh, the rate of growth here. So. That wraps up our video here. Now, of course, you got to go do it. Please go back. Make sure you've watched our monetary video. Extremely important. And then look for notifications of our upcoming videos as well. Now, what I'd love you for you to do, of course, is to comment below. Tell me where I made a mistake. Tell me where you agree with me. Give me your ideas of how this is going to play out. But just look at it from an economic point of view. What's the economy going to do in the coming year? And of course, we'd obviously love you to like, subscribe, notify, do all that good stuff. All right. Talk to you later. Talk to you in the next video. I hope you found that useful because our next step is we're going to take a look at what the normal seasonality is for a pre-election year. Now, in 2022, seasonality worked perfectly. So we can't expect it to work as well as it did this year. But nonetheless, there's a lot of deep insights that seasonality is going to tell us about how the upcoming year is going to be. So stay tuned and watch our next video.